It looks like we are live and um, I'm going to give everyone just a minute or two to jump in from the waiting room. Um, I see all the names starting to pop up there. While everybody is being transferred in, I just want to thank Dr. Kelly for her time tonight for being here for yet another webinar, um, which, you know, she's just a wealth of information um, on many, many, many topics. Um, but, but for sure, when it comes to things that relate to mold and mycotoxins, tick-borne diseases, um, those type of chronic and, and complex conditions and cases. Dr. Kelly is definitely one of our go-to speakers. Um, and so tonight she's gonna be speaking on chronic inflammatory syndrome um, and a little bit about that, what the lab markers associated with it mean, uh, cause some of them are very specialized and, and might be things that you're not familiar with or, or that you may not have run before. Um, a little bit about Dr. Kelly in case you're not familiar with her. Um, she is board certified in family medicine, um, one of the was among one of the first physicians to become board certified in integrative medicine, um, especially um, studying causes, effects, and treatments of Lyme disease, as well as lecturing on that and other topics. She graduated from Ohio State University College of Medicine and completed her residency in family medicine at St. Joseph Hospital in Chicago. Um, she is a 10-year member of the Institute of Functional Medicine and is now the treasurer on the board of ILADS, as well as a founding member of the Academy of Integrative Health and Medicine. Um, she has founded Case Integrative Health. That is her practice in the Chicago area. Um, she also, previous to that or prior to that, practiced at Whole Health Chicago, Michigan Avenue Immediate Care, and St. Joseph Hospital. Um, so Dr. Kelly, thank you. Welcome. Um, it's great to have you back again tonight. And if you want to go ahead and share your screen, um, I'll turn it over and I'll let you take it away. Perfect. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you for having me and welcome everybody. Let me get everything up here. All right. So we're going to talk about labs today. We're going to deep dive into these SIRS labs and a little bit about what SIRS is and talk about some cases and how this has helped me help my patients. So what is SIRS? Well, SIRS is chronic inflammatory response syndrome. It's also called biotoxin illness or mold toxicity illness. And it's been estimated that 80% of human biotoxin illness is driven by indoor air contaminated with mold toxins or other inflammagens from gram-negative bacteria and mycobacteria. And this exposure leads to chronic multi-system illness in people who are susceptible to poor toxin clearance, which we'll talk about a little bit. Of note, it's not truly a medical diagnosis. It's more of a collection of red flags that indicate an inflammatory root cause is present and it affects multiple systems in the body and can really make people feel unwell. And it's frustrating because they will go to their general practitioner and their labs are normal and you know they just kind of get brushed off, but they know that something is wrong. So that's where we come in and we can do some more testing. Just a little brief primer here on mold spores versus mold toxins. So I think of spores as relatively gigantic. Um, they are large enough to cause local respiratory system irritation in an immune response, and they are going to cause your, cause your typical allergy-like symptoms. So allergic rhinitis, asthma, and um, when most people are testing mold inside versus outside, uh, they're generally going to be looking at spores, which isn't super helpful when it comes to mold toxins. Because mold toxins or mycotoxins are extremely tiny. They are nanoparticles, less than 0.01 microns in size. And they can cause a whole host of immune reactions and inflammation. They are what's responsible for the smell of mold or mildew. Um, brewer's yeast is an example of a mycotoxin that helps to form alcohol. And another um, example is St. Anthony's fire, which is a gangrene that's caused by a mycotoxin that's on fungus on stored rye um, and has been linked to things like the Salem witch trial. There are, um, as far as making um, brains inflamed and causing some strange behavior. So it has been linked to that. 
in between spores and mycotoxins, you have spore fragments. Um, so there's also something kind of in the middle as well that's, that can get missed. So there's all kinds of different ways that mold can cause human illness. And unfortunately, the spores are the ones who get most of the, um, the looks when it comes um, to conventional medicine. But there are a lot of other ways that they cause issues. So how do we diagnose it? Well, first, the symptoms. There are a lot of symptoms. They overlap with a lot of other things, and they can be almost generic, you know, and a lot of people will have fatigue and joint pain. But one of the hallmarks that I have found is the fatigue is a sleepiness where they can't keep their eyes open, like their eyes are too heavy to stay open. That's more of a mold symptom of fatigue. However, it can be any kind of fatigue or weakness. Sometimes these people will also have static shocks and electric shock sensations. So it's an always an interesting question to say to your patients, um, when you're walking around the house and you touch somebody, do you shock them a lot? Um, people will look at you very, very funny, but usually they'll answer yes. Um, and also ice pick like pain. So they'll have shooting pains all around their body that are ice pick in nature. Uh, that migrate around, that I, is also one of the pearls of, of SIRS. But you can see here, there's a list of many different symptoms, headaches, poor memory, trouble finding the right words, joint pain, stiffness, numbness, shortness of breath, sinus congestion, body temperature regulation, waking up in the middle of the night thirsty or having to pee, mood swings, abdominal pain, Lots and lots of different symptoms fit under this category. Um, and we'll see why as we kind of dive into the labs and, and what exactly happens to our immune system with these toxins. This is a little shout out to Dr. Jill Krista. She's got a great mold quiz uh, online that you can utilize, that you can have patients fill out. It's pretty quick, it's pretty easy. And you know, if they score a 10 or a 10 or higher, then you absolutely should be doing some of these blood tests to look into mold as a possible. So how do we test for mycotoxins? Well, we can actually test your urine for the mycotoxins. Vibrant has a great panel that uses mass spec and tests for 31 different mycotoxins. There are a couple other labs that test for mycotoxins as well. And this is just testing for what you're spilling out in your urine. So it's and then giving you an overall body burden idea of what kind of myco mycotoxins are present. However, you may have a lot more hiding in your tissues than is coming out in the urine. So just keep that in mind when you're looking at that mycotoxin test. If you get that, um, there's all the surge blood testing, which we're going to go into um, a deep dive here in just a sec. Then you can also do a couple other things too. You can get a neuroquant MRI which is an MRI, it's, a, it's kind of a normal MRI, no um, contrast is needed, but it looks at different volumes of the brainstem and other parts of the brain, which um, Dr. Shoemaker has put together and, and kind of is shown in some ways that certain areas that are affected either too big or too small are affiliated with mold versus Lyme versus PTSD, for example. Uh, NeuroQuant is also used for Alzheimer's and looking at that based on normal comparisons for age, sex um, in their database. So it can be a very, very useful tool and it is something that you can monitor over time um, as well to look at. You can also do some VCS testing, which is looking at your peripheral nervous, or sorry, your peripheral vision. And as that can get very disrupted by toxins. Um, and neurotoxins especially. And that's a test that's either free or very, very cheap. And that's a nice way too, to help follow your patients as they're going through their treatments um, that you can utilize as well. Okay. This is Dr. Shoemaker's biotoxin pathway. It looks complex when you look at it initially, but it's actually not too bad. And, and when we start to really dive into the labs and why we do the labs that we do for SIRS, this starts to make a lot more sense. So up in the left um, corner, that's you know, the toxins coming into the system and, and how they affect us. So it affects our fat cells and our hypothalamus, our nerve cells, 
and our capillaries, our immune system, all of our hormones can get disrupted as well based on the different changes that these toxins create. And this is a good one to refer back to. I like to have this printed and laminated to show to patients to explain why their labs are off and what it means and what it's showing and how this whole system works together in this inflammatory cascade that leads to a whole host of issues. So how does it work? So when mycotoxins are inhaled, eaten, touched, or even made in the body, you can make your own mycotoxins, especially gliotoxins. Initially, they enter the fat cells where they're supposed to be stored because the solution to pollution is dilution. So the body will try to store toxins in your fat cells. But when it does, it binds to a toll-like receptor on the outside of the fat cell. And that binding actually activates NF-kappa beta, which then activates the nucleus of the cell to produce cytokines, creating an inflammatory cascade. And the mycotoxins can lead to an uncontrolled cytokine release. And that's where the issues start to come is when these cytokines and this inflammation is uncontrolled, and that's where the symptoms come from. This directly impacts your immune system your hormones, and your neurological function, amongst other things. So how do we clear them out of our system? Well, genetics play a big role in this, and there are a good 25% of people who just can't clear these toxins. They don't have the ability to make antibodies to recognize the toxins, um, so they can't clear them out. So the toxins just continue to float around and cause more and more havoc. If you happen to have antibodies to these toxins, you may not get sick at all or only mildly. So this is where you run into some issues when you have a family who's living in a moldy house and only one person is sick. Everybody else is totally fine. So that really creates this isolating disease for the person who is sick because everybody else feels okay. Why don't they feel okay? And then other people look at them and think that they're making this up or it's all in their head, which is rather unfortunate for these people. Um, but it, it, it's confusing and it makes it hard for other people to understand why they're so sick because if their you know, loved ones are living in their house and they're not sick, it, it's difficult, it's very tricky. If we're not able to make antibodies, we have to use different transport systems and other ways to clear these toxins. So one of the big ways is through the organic ion transport system in the small bile ducts of the liver to remove the toxins in the bile. But those toxins unfortunately tend to get reabsorbed into the enteropathic circulation. So we're never really clearing these toxins out. So if you're living in a space and still getting exposed to these neurological and hepatotoxic toxins, and you can't get rid of the toxins that you are you know, have already been exposed to, it just compounds on itself and never ends. So how do the mycotoxins affect your hormones? The big one that it really hones in on is the melanocyte stimulating hormone or MSH. MSH is a regulator of peripheral cytokines and inflammation. And it binds in a lot of different places in the body, but in the brain and on what blood, white blood cells, that binding typically reduces inflammation. MSH is a regulator of anterior and posterior pituitary function. So a low MSH leads to low adrenal hormones, low sex hormones, low thyroid hormones, low ADH. And all of that leads to increases in pain and poor sleep, for example. MSH also controls mucous membrane-based immune defense system. So it reduces the defenses. Low MSH is going to reduce the defenses in this area, makes making the body more vulnerable and susceptible to invasion and colonization with things like Marcon's, which is a multiple antibiotic resistant coagulase negative staph in the nose. Marcon's is, is a pretty common thing we talk about when it comes to SIRS and, and mold toxin illness. And you can have this colonization in your nose and not have any typical nasal congestion, nasal symptoms, sinus, um, infection type symptoms, but that colonization just breeds inflammation in your nose. These, these bacteria destroy red blood cells. They um, secrete exotoxin A, all of which 
feeds this loop and destroys MSH um, and actually makes biofilms. A little worded a little funny there on the, on the screen. Low MSH also leads to low endorphins, and that has been associated with things like fibromyalgia, irritable spilt syndrome, interstitial cystitis. So MSH is extremely important hormone. And if when this becomes low, it really causes havoc for the entire system. Um, so this is one of the reasons why we check this on our SIRS panel. Next hormone we look at is antidiuretic hormone, which is a hypothalamic hormone that regulates the water and the fluid levels in the body via the kidneys. And if you have low ADH, you're gonna have more frequent urination and you're gonna get easily dehydrated. Uh, this is a marker of disrupted MSH function. And it's also associated with reduced VE VEGF production, which is coming up. Uh, it can lead to disruptions in your electrolytes, frequent urination, excessive thirst, edema. This is to plays a role in those static shocks that I was talking about. And typically this also causes a lot of nighttime urination. So people who wake up a lot in the middle of the night and have to pee may have a low ADH. And if you can't sleep because you're up peeing all the time, that's just going to continue to, to propagate this neurological toxicity. ACTH and cortisol, so adrenocorticotropic hormone, which is made in the anterior pituitary and stimulates the adrenals to make lots of hormones, including cortisol, our major stress hormone, DHEA, which balances cortisol and, and also supports testosterone, and mineral, mineral corticoids as well. What I thought was things really interesting is stressed cells they signal the creation of more cortisol, which is our stress hormone. And that is actually independent of ACTH. So you can have very unconnected levels of ACTH and cortisol that you may not expect when someone's under a lot of stress or, un, or the body's under a lot of stress from toxins. Low morning cortisol can definitely be a sign of adrenal insufficiency. Early in SIRS, People will often have a high ACTH as the system is trying to react and trying to pump out more cortisol and more reaction to this, this threat that's happening to the body. However, when you see that ACTH fall, that's where a lot of the symptoms really will start to, to creep up in a patient. If someone has high ACTH and high cortisol, you can definitely consider tumors. You, you don't want to miss any other endocrine issue that may be happening here, but often these levels will correct with therapy. Um, and as we, we start to reduce the toxin burden and lower the inflammation in the system, this usually improves, but definitely worth monitoring as well. What are some other markers that we look at in our source panel? So this is the VEGF or vascular endothelial growth factor. So VEGFs are cytokines that can cause endothelial cells to release adhesions and integrins that create blockages and capillaries. And these, these blockages lead to poor circulation and poor oxygenation of your tissues. And when our tissues have low oxygen, then the body releases hypoxia inducible factor which produces VEGF to build more capillaries and EPO to make new red blood cells. So sometimes VEGF can be rather high, especially in early SIRS, because it's trying to compensate for that low oxygen delivery. However, when we have this uncontrolled cytokine, the VEGF goes down and we have even more capillary hyperperfusion. And that low oxygenation potential leads to fatigue, cognitive impairment, myalgias, mitochondrial dysfunction. VEGF is affected by other things too, including Lyme, uh, Babesia, so often below. Bartonella will sometimes make VEGF high. So you, you know, when you're kind of looking at the entire picture, um, don't forget to think about those as culprits in here too. This is typically, in, in my practice, from what I've seen clinically, one of the last things to balance out 
in repair. Um, I'm excited for Vibrant because my lab doesn't really give me great numbers on this. Anything less than 31 is less than 31 and it could be 30, it could be two. So I'm you know, excited to have something a little more specific to monitor this. Next up is vasoactive intestinal peptide or VIP. This is a neuropeptide. It has receptors in the hypothalamus and it is very important anti-inflammatory immune modulator. Um, it's going to affect both the innate and the adapted, um, adaptive immune system and is very anti-inflammatory and inhibits the in production of this inflammatory cytokines and, and things from our macrophages and our dendritic cells and our micro, microglia. Um, it also is a very potent vasodilator and it helps to regulate blood flow in the intestines. So low levels is another sign of this capillary hypoperfusion. So we've got a couple different ways now that we're just not getting oxygen to our tissues and kind of running on fumes. Um, it also regulates smooth muscle activity and epithelial cell secretions. Uh, it helps to determine which antigens the immune system will tolerate. So it is being used and, and studied to treat different autoimmune diseases and disorders. And low levels will lead to shortness of breath and exercise um, as well. So if people are really winded with exercise, this is something to think about. Um, these levels um, are, are typically some of the last that you, we actively treat if they're not coming up. Um, we need to make sure that they're out of mold, that uh, one way to check that are the urine mycotoxins, um, but also the VCS testing can be used for this. Um, it also is important to make sure they don't have an active chronic infection like Lyme with this, um, with vasoactive peptide, uh, which you can get compounded. It does have some um, pancreatic issues to monitor with it, um, but can really help to bring back people when they're really fatigued and everything else has been addressed this can help to restore that. And you know, I'm hoping there's more and more research on it for autoimmune diseases and things in the future too. VIP. TGF beta one or transforming growth factor beta one. This is a multifunctional cytokine and it is both anti-inflammatory and pro-inflammatory if depending on what side of the teeter-totter it's on. It inhibits proliferation, differentiation, activation, and effector functions of immune cells. So it can be a very, very potent immune and tumor suppressor. Um, it also helps promote tolerance to allergens and self-allergens, so it helps the autoimmune side of things. Um, really high levels of it are gonna help promote immune invasion leading to chronic infections and spurring that on. It also can cause fibrosis, chronic elevations. Um, if someone has breathing issues and they have a high transforming growth factor beta, especially one that won't come down, it's definitely worth looking at a chest x-ray to make sure they don't have any pulmonary fibrosis. Um, and um, these, these high levels that we will see show impairment of T regulatory cells, which can be an activation of autoimmunity. So this is another one of the pathways that can lead to an autoimmune picture secondary to mold toxins. And it also shows an imbalanced innate adaptive immune system response. So when I see this, I'm thinking your immune system is overactive, it's in hyperdrive, it's in this autoimmune side of things and it's in this inflamed state. Um, and it has been shown, for example, in diseases like MS to be very high, um, but it, it's definitely, definitely something to, to monitor and watch and it will come down. Um, there are some treatments um, such as um, Losartan to help bring this down, um, you know, 
it is a blood pressure medicine. So you need to monitor that, but that can help treat this and bring this down if, if nothing else is working. But usually with immune um, and anti-inflammatory herbs and things, this will come down pretty nicely on its own. Matrix metalloproteinase 9 or MMP9. This is an innate immune system activity marker. It's a protein digesting enzyme. So it breaks down connective tissue. And when it does that, it allows inflammatory compounds like toxins or infections to enter tissues. And high levels are seen with increased tumor invasiveness as well as infection spread and toxin spread. It is found in high levels are found in COPD, rheumatoid arthritis, atherosclerosis, cardiomyopathy, and um, aortic abdominal aneurysms. When I see really high levels, I'm also concerned about a leaky brain. So the permeability of the blood brain barrier is likely increased when you have a very high MMP9, which is very important to regulate, especially with the neurological symptoms that can happen with SIRS. Coagulation markers. There are several different coagulation markers that you can look at. Um, with things like VEGF responding to the different um, endothelial disruption that can happen from these mycotoxins and the, the coagulation, coagulation issues that can happen from the toxins themselves. If people have disruptions in their PA1, their von Willebrand factor, or their anti-cardiolipins on top of these mold toxins or spurred on by these mold toxins, it just needs to increase your um, attention to the blood flow. So PA1 is a marker of increased blood coagulation. So when you have high levels, you have a decreased ability to break down clots. Von Wildebrand factor is a marker for increased blood thinning. So low levels are more indicative of bleeding disorders and trouble stopping the bleeding. And also anticardiolipins, which are actually markers of autoimmunity and are seen in antiphospholipid syndrome, lupus. Um, and high levels have an increased risk of blood clots as well as miscarriages. So it just adds to the mix um, from the endothelial disruption that happens in the capillaries. And you know, if you have an underlying issue or, or um, you've now created this autoimmune activation in the body and these cardiolipins are being affected, they're gonna be at much higher risk for coagulation issues. Complements. Complement cells are components of the overstimulated immune system and they activate inflammatory responses and, and do multiple things, like cause smooth muscles to contract, dilate vascular permeability issues. Um, they cause local inflammatory responses as well and degranulate mast cells and endothelial cells. Um, they are anaphylactic, anaphylaxis inducing. Um, C3A, can be either inflammatory or anti-inflammatory. It causes T cell activation and mast cell degranulation and can also cause vasoconstriction and hypertension. C4A elevations are seen in excess response to biotoxins and have been associated with chronic fatigue syndrome, lupus, as well as Lyme. If you have a high C4A and a low C3A, that is a strong sign that a biotoxin is, burnt, is present, um, such as mold. If you have a high C4A and a high C3A, that is more indicative of an infection, such as Lyme. I just saw a patient today who had high C4A and a normal C3A. So, you know, they're kind of in the middle and definitely some mold history in there, but I think theirs is more Lyme, but it's hard to say from that test by itself. It is of note that these are rather quickly reacting labs. So you can see a rise in their blood within 12 hours of being exposed. So sometimes if people come in and they've, they've got a C4A that's off the charts, it's possible that it's because they were exposed in a store the day before. Um, not necessarily that 
their house is still moldy or that, you know, whatever. So you, sometimes you have to kind of dig into that history a little bit um, if you see big jumps in their levels. So all of these compose the SERS panel by Vibrant. So you've got your VEGF, you've got your ADH, you've got your ACTH, you've got your anti-cardiolipins. Um, just looking at these to make sure. <laughs> I changed some of these yesterday and I wanted to make sure I've got them all right. Um, the other ones include VIP, MSH, TGF-beta-1, MMP9, PA1, that's the plasminogen activator inhibitor one, C4A, C3A, as well as the von Willebrand factor. And that um, is what you're gonna find on this panel, which are gonna help you not only diagnose SIRS, but also monitor it and hopefully help a lot more people along the way. P patients will get excited when they see abnormalities on their labs, especially if they've been to five other doctors and all of their labs are quote unquote normal. When you start to do these non-typical labs and you see that there's inflammation, you can say, you know, your C4A is off the charts. No wonder you feel inflamed. You are inflamed. You know, people can kind of resonate with that. And that can also help you figure out how to help them better. I just wanted to touch on too some genes. These are not part of the SERS panel, but these are the HLA DRB1 genes. Um, this is just a slide for you to look at later um, if you decide to do these genes on people. And, and this goes back to what I was saying towards the beginning, how 25% of people can't even make antibodies because they're not, they don't, they're not able to make antibodies against these toxins. And so these labs um, can help discern which patients are more susceptible to these mold toxins and who's going to be able to clear the mold toxins easier. All right, now I have some cases. You can kind of dig in here a little bit um, on what I've seen. So my first case is a 44-year-old female. She just moved into her new home four years ago. The house was actually built in 1909 and was renovated in 2016. Um, old houses are actually often better than newer houses around the 70s when we started um, sealing up our houses much differently and that had less airflow, which also means more mold growth. So the old house, the 1909 doesn't bother me, but the renovation in 2006, you know, that could definitely cause some issues. Soon after she moved into her house, she started experiencing exhaustion, bloating, brain fog, headaches. She was losing her hair. She had itching everywhere. She just assumed it was, you know, being a four-year-old and having kids and, you know, a busy life. She saw a functional medicine provider who diagnosed her with adrenal fatigue and food sensitivities. And she did start to improve with some of those treatments, but not enough. So she saw 10 other providers, um, one of which prescribed her Lexapro, which did not help. Eventually, somebody finally decided to test for Lyme and mold. And then she came to see me. So those lab results at the end of last year, her Lyme Western blot had no bands present whatsoever. And this was from Medical Diagnostic Laboratory, which is a fairly decent insurance-based Lyme lab. Her CD57, which is a Lyme marker, was 36. That's pretty low. I'd like to see that around 100. So some innate immune system dysfunction. Her TGF beta is high, 10,880. That, that's, that's pretty good. My lab at the, right now, um, high range is 2,380, I believe. C4A was actually normal, 2016. Um, my lab, I think 2,800 roughly is anything less than that is considered normal. Her CRP is pretty good. Her CBC was normal. Thyroid is good. Vitamin D is okay for these parts. 47, I'll take that. Um, free testosterone, cortisol. I think this was a morning cortisol. I can't remember exactly. This wasn't done by me. Um, at 10, so that's okay. Uh, estrogen were high. Her alpha MSH levels low, 9.9. .9. 
um, really depends on who you talk to, where the alpha MSH level should be. Um, Dr. Shoemaker is going to suggest 25 to 35. I think 14 seems to be a more normal level for my patients, um, at least my healthier patients. So nine is definitely on the low side. She had some um, urine mycotoxin testing, which showed high okra toxin and gliotoxin. And her home tested, had her home tested and was quote, off the charts positive for black mold for the patient, especially in the basement, but all over the house as well. So they moved out of the house, moved out of the house. They had it remediated. It sounds like they did a really good job. They had it treated like asbestos and the repeat testing after the remediation was safe for the patient. I haven't seen those markers, um, but when I talked to the patient about it, they were for the mold toxins, not the mold spores. So that seemed a little more safe. Um, she did a cell core brand detox on her own while she was out of the house. Um, they bought Air Doctor purifiers and put them on every level of the house. And they have an IR sauna that was deep cleaned in this process as well. They moved in about three or four weeks ago, but she still just doesn't feel great. Maybe a little better, not much of anything to, to write home about. So here's what we started with. Um, I encourage her to use her sauna daily as tolerated. She always feels better after she does a sauna. So that's why daily is okay. If someone does a sauna and feels a lot worse afterwards, more fatigued, headache, you know, that that's a probably in there for too long. B, they, they only need to do it once or twice a week. If that I put her on in acetylcysteine to support glutathione production, but also because it's useful for gliotoxins and to help clear out gliotoxins. And I have a little slide later on about the different toxins, which I think is a good, good tool to have too. Put on some glutathione because I wanted to make sure that she's processing and filtering through these toxins. And then I put on some binders and I started her on charcoal and optifibrillin. Optifibrillin is a very specific glucomannan fiber that has been shown to help, especially um, with aspergillus mycotoxins, but all of the mycotoxins. And it's not nearly as constipating as some of the other binders. And you can take it with food. So just like, as far as the timing of everything, it's just kind of nice to have something else to add that doesn't have to be two hours apart from everything else. I also put her on butyrate. Butyrate is a short chain fatty acid that heals the gut lining, but also on a cellular level helps to clear toxins out of cells and can be very helpful with mold toxins. Um, and saccharomycin. Saccharomycin is Saccharomyces boulardii. Uh, and again, for those gliotoxins that I was concerned about, which can be a big sign of candida because candida overgrowth, candida can, can make gliotoxin. So I wanted to make sure to support all of that. I like to come at these toxins from multiple different angle, angles, not just binders. Um, I don't usually personally start with prescription binders, but um, I just think they're harsh and hard to take. Um, and if I don't eat them, great. <laughs> I also gave her some anti-inflammatories just as a mold hit kit. That's what I call it um, to help lower inflammation. If you come in contact with mold or just every day as you're trying to rebalance from mold. Dehist, which is a quercetin product to help with the allergy-like symptoms, but also the TH1, TH2 shift that happens. And I started on some ozone therapy right away as well to see if we could help neutralize some of these toxins and support our detox and help to fight off anything that's going on. So her follow-up labs, um, she does have, uh, a, her D level came down just a smidge, but it's pretty much the same. Her ANA is high. Um, so there's definitely an autoimmune component to all of this. Her um, lupus panel was totally normal. I doubled up on some of these labs on here. Uh, <laughs> ECP is 16, which can be a marker for parasites and allergies, there's that candida, candida albicans, IgG was high at 1.3. Um, skip a little bit, her CIC or candida immune complex was also high. So those are markers of a high yeast issue. So this is another one of these colonizations that can happen with, with chronic mold, um, just like the Marcon's colonization. This one needs to be dealt with. She also has a very low ADH. Um, osmolality is normal. 
So she noticed with her initial treatments that her fatigue and her joint pain has increased. Uh, and I see her again in a couple weeks. And we're going to talk about maybe some candida treatment, maybe some Marcons, and maybe some low dose naltrexone. And I spelled naltrexone funny. It's not naltrexone, it's naltrexone, which is a great autoimmune balancer and um, gut healer and great supporter of this entire process. So we're, we're going to, those are some of the things I kind of have in mind uh, moving forward for her. I have, I have a couple more cases. I'm actually going to skip to case three. I want to make sure um, we have enough time and then I'll go back to case two. If, if we need to, I just want to make sure there's some time for questions in here. So case three or two is a 58 year old woman from Bulgaria. So she grew up with many pets who had ticks on them. And the only thing you really of note growing up is she had idiopathic hematuria for years that started in her twenties. In 2011, she entered menopause and had increased fatigue. 2012, she started on hormones, which did help her hot flashes. But in 2015, she had a big mold exposure in a flooded building. In 2016, after that, she developed constant nausea, digestion complaints, diarrhea, burping, dizziness, extreme fatigue, brain fog. She was diagnosed with H. pylori. Uh, via an endoscopy, but she couldn't tolerate the antibiotics. She did an herbal protocol that did seem to help. And most of her symptoms got better at that point until they didn't again. So in 2017, she started having a lot of symptoms again, fatigue, dizziness. She was diagnosed with Hashimoto's at that time, and she was started on a very low dose of Nutrithroid. And she's not sure if it helps, but her labs got better, so she stuck with it. Um, she had continued to have digestive symptoms, and she was diagnosed with SIBO. She did candy bactin protocol and tolerated that, did help her stomach, but it didn't help her energy. I met her in 2019. At that point, she was having headaches, brain fog, exhaustion, insomnia, muscle weakness, pain, night sweats, anxiety. These were her initial labs with me. Thyroid looks okay. Kidney liver function was fine. DHEA was good. Blood sugar's good. White blood cells were a little low. And her lymphocytes were low and her ESR was okay. Vitamin D is great. I don't see a level of 73.6 too much around these parts. Um, CP is chlamydia pneumoniae. IgG of one to 64 is a, a very normal positive level. Probably not a reactivation, but she'd been exposed to it. But did aspergillus antibodies, which were normal. She had a CD57, which was 56. So that's low. I like to see that over hundred. Her VEGF was low, her alpha MSH was low, her ADH was low, her MMP9 at 232 is actually pretty good. I was happy with that level. I like to see that number under 500. Um, anything above that and I start to worry about that neurological inflammation. Her stachyboitrous antibodies uh, are considered normal at 2.4, but that shows me at some point she's had some exposure to that particular mold. Her C4A was 15,989. That's a pretty good level right there. <laughs> and her TGF beta was normal. So I started her on a low mold diet. Uh, we talked about having her home mold tested. She was no longer in that building that flooded, but we still wanted to make sure she wasn't constantly getting exposed. I started her on glutathione to help flush out the toxins and then charcoal and zeolite to help bind up the toxins turmeric, some fish oil to help lower inflammation. And I put her on some Saccharomyces boulardii because she has a history of SIBO. And as I mentioned before, it can help with gliotoxins if there's a candida issue, especially. So her follow-up labs uh, showed actually an increase of her chlamydia pneumoniae. Her IgG was the same, but her IgA was now positive. Mycoplasma 1.8 is very normal old infection. CD57 improved, came up to 83. VEGF, still really low. Alpha MSH, better, better. C4A, a lot better. We're making progress. Okay, we're moving on here. I increased her sauna. I'm sorry, increased her detox. I had her go to an IR sauna pretty regularly. I continued her on the binder zeolite and charcoal, but I added an optifibrillin. She was still tired and another provider tested her 
for SIBO, which was positive. So she went back to Candy Bactin. BR, which is a berberine-based product. Alimax, which is Allison or garlic. And Interface Plus, which is a biofilm buster. We also started her on low-dose naltrexone, which really helped her sleep and her anxiety, um, as well as the SIBO because it helps with gut motility. And we started talking about neuroplasticity and how we need to start retraining our brain to think differently um, and to really process our, our thoughts differently and to help stop the brain from perpetuating the inflammation um, because it thinks it's doing that to help, but it's not. And her follow-up labs looked, definitely looked better. Um, her TGF beta was still normal. VEGF still low, VIP still low. Uh, alpha MSH is better. T C4A now totally normal. Thyroid okay, lipase okay, blood sugar, glucose. B one's a little high. Not sure she's drinking enough water. Homocysteine was great. Um, her white blood cells and neutrophils were still low, but her CD57 was great now. It had come up to 115. Um, and that's without any Lyme treatment or anything. I was just monitoring that along the way as we were treating the mold. And she had a negative VCS test. So our next step, I'm gonna try some VIP nasal spray with her and see if that can't get us to the next level with her energy um, and her fatigue to see if we can improve, approve upon that. But it's just kind of fun to watch those labs normalize. And when they're not normalizing enough, you can go back and add more to the mix and see how things go. Um, just to touch on treatment a little bit, I've had, there's other webinars on this, but definitely need to reduce exposure, support the detox, find the biotoxins, reduce inflammation, look for colonizations, especially in the nose and the gut, and then look for other therapies like VIP, for example. I referred to this a little bit uh, before. I think this is just a good one to kind of have in your back pocket. Um, depending on what bio or what mycotoxins show up, uh, if you do a urine test or if you have their home tested and you know that there's penicillium, this can help show you what particular binders are going to be best for that toxin. And you know, mold is complex. There's a lot of things happening. Testing helps. Testing helps you monitor and make sure you're moving in the right direction and helps highlight it, the next steps that need to be addressed, like the VEGF or the VIP. Um, I can go back and do the other case, but I don't know if there's any questions, Sarah, that need to be asked, because I think this would be a good time to stop um, if there are. Yes, we actually do have, it looks like there are a few questions. Um, if you want, I can rattle those off to you. Sure. All right. Um, Anne asked, can mold toxicity induce lupus, RA, and other autoimmune conditions? Yes, through those pathways. Um, it absolutely can spur on an autoimmune, any kind of autoimmune condition. You know, there's definitely going to be a genetic component to that as well. So if you are genetically inclined for developing rheumatoid arthritis, it might develop a rheumatoid arthritis like picture, but it can absolutely be a driver for any kind of autoimmune disease. Great. Okay. Uh, let's see. What if someone has both, both lab low C4A and C3A? Both low. Mm -hmm. That's a good sign. That means that they're able to clear out their toxins pretty well. That is, you know, it could be a sign of normal inflammation. It's one marker of inflammation. So there still may be inflamed in other areas, but two normal levels, C3A, C4A, those are reassuring. And it doesn't mean that there's not mold present entirely because you have to look at the whole picture. But if those are both normal, it's less likely that mold is the current driving factor for whatever is happening in their system. Okay. Um, let's see. Do you find any benefit with nebulized glutathione with mold, um, aspergillosis, for instance, related chronic lung disease confirmed with bronchoscopy? Um, I don't have any patients with those particular specifications, but I have used nebulized glutathione. I've used it for a couple COVID patients most recently. And other than the patients telling me it that it feels like they're inhaling a fart. 
um, it does seem to, to offer some help with the lung uh, symptoms specifically. So I, I do find it useful. Great. Okay. Um, dosing for Sporinox and how often to check AST and ALT? So it really depends on the patient. You could check it every single month if you wanted to, um, or if you're concerned, you can check it um, a couple weeks in and then a month later. And if it's normal, then you don't necessarily need to keep watching it. Um, Sporinox is itroconazole. Um, and typically it's going to be 200 milligrams twice a day. Uh, you can, you can go, you could go higher than that. You could also go a lot lower than that. Um, you could start really low 100 milligrams a day and work your way up. I haven't had to go higher than 200 twice a day, but you could go up to three times a day if you really, really needed to, if you're going to go up to those higher levels, I would check the liver more often. Okay, great. Um, let's see. Are you seeing these lab patterns in post COVID syndrome? <laughs> uh, I am, I am, I am seeing a lot of tick-borne infections in my COVID long haulers almost without fail at this point. Um, less specifically the mold issues, but I'm absolutely seeing a lot of tick-borne issues. So ticks or tick infections are going to cause very similar lab changes. So I, I do see these, uh, like these inflammatory markers elevated in COVID and post-COVID. Okay. Um, let's see. Let's do uh, some of these are probably not best for live questions. Um, best way to get rid of aflatoxin M1. So this, this is why I like this slide a lot. Back to this one. So aflatoxins um, are from aspergillus and charcoal, bentonite clay, and then glucomannan, which is that optifibrillin. It's very specifically optifibrillin from, from Zymogen that helps with the aflatoxins. Great. Okay. Let's do one more um, and then we can wrap it up. Um, the last question. Let me, let me say one more thing about Optifiber too. Um, it comes in capsule or pill. I'm sorry, capsule or powder. Powder has to be mixed and you have to drink it immediately. It turns to a gelatinous ooze if you don't. However, um, the pills can be a lot of pills. So sometimes you need to go up to four, five, six pills three times a day um, to, if you're, if you're not getting a good enough response, but it is a fiber. So I don't ever start anybody on the high doses. I start really low one pill a couple times a day to make sure their gut can tolerate it. Cause it can cause a lot of gas and bloating and other issues. If the patient has other disruptions in their gut. So be mindful. Okay, perfect. Um, let's see, how do you address low WBC and neutrophils? Oh, on the last patient. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I've been monitoring her. Um, and if I, I went back and looked at a lot of her old labs and she's just kind of been chronically low like that. And she's says she's had other doctors look into it in detail in the past and no one's ever come up with anything. I would assume that it's some sort of chronic infection or immune aggravation, um, for that. And so if it's, continues to lay low, I will do some more digging into it. She has no symptoms necessarily related to that specifically. Um, so uh, the biggest thing is to just keep digging to, to see maybe there's um, a chronic viral issue that's underlying all of this that needs to be balanced as part of the immune system imbalance. But yeah, that absolutely will need to be followed up on. All right. Um... Well, Dr. Kelly, did you have anything else you wanted to add as far as information? Um, do you have um, a website people can go check out if they want to read a little bit more about you or, you know, any of the content that you have out there or social media um, where they can follow you? Absolutely. Yes. Our website is caseintegrativehealth.com. We're on Instagram and Facebook at Case Integrative Health. Um, and we're roundabout. We've got lots of blogs and, and, and things out there. Uh, as well. So, and you can email us at support at caseintegrativehealth.com if you have any questions for us otherwise. 
Thank you. Um, so Dr. Kelly, thanks for your time tonight. Um, you're always so generous with your information. Um, and I mean, everything, everything that we have <laughs> that you've done has always been so helpful as far as the, um, the quality and the experience. And you can tell that you're really passionate about um, this subject. So I really want to thank you again for your time. Um, if you are listening in, the recording will generally be available and up in our portal, portal within two to three business days. Um, you also should get emailed a link that has um, a link to the recording again around the time that, that you'll see it up in the portal. Um, slides should generally be available in the portal along with the recording. Um, so give us a few days to get all of that processed. Um, and then I just want to thank everyone who tuned in tonight. Thanks for your time. I hope you all, all have a good night. And thanks again, Dr. Kelly. Have a great night. Thanks, Sarah. Have a good one. Thanks. Bye-bye.